Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Today, I'm having a conversation with Preston Spiles. We met a few years ago when he was reading my book. We're going to talk about that, but it's so great to have this conversation. He's an abundance and personal freedom coach. He is known for his speaking, for his Instagram channel, for the ways that he touches people's lives. Today, he's going to be discussing about the importance of self-compassion on our journey to finding financial freedom, his insights on spiritual wealth, the transformation of limiting beliefs, the connection between our personal growth and our financial success, all things that I love to talk about. I know you're going to enjoy this conversation. It was really refreshing and super fun. Enjoy. Preston, this has been a long time coming. I'm so very happy for this conversation. Yeah, same, same. Again, I was sharing with you offline and I actually went and looked for it. Um, I, uh, my team sent me uh, who I was doing podcasts with over the next four days or whatever. And I just, your name just popped off the page. And I was like, I think I know her. <laughs> and then I went and researched and I was like, I have her book. And not only do I have her book, I have notes in it. I have like, you know, I went through this Woo! book. Um, <laughs> I didn't finish it, but you know, th there for me, and even how I who, how I came to your book. And it's interesting that I'm writing a book called Spiritual Millionaire, and you have one called The Mindful Millionaire. Um, by the way, out October first. Let's go. Ooh. Uh huh. Yay! Um, so what's interesting for me is I used to be such a book nerd and let's call it two years ago I just was like you know what I'm gonna go all in on the area of finances and abundance and money and I went to Barnes and Nobles by myself and then I do this whole thing where I say spirit lead me where you want me right and there's all kinds of books on these subjects and I grabbed three that were like grab me and of the three I only bought one this one Woo. <laughs> because I start, I read the beginnings of all three and I was like, Oh, like there's something about when somebody it's not just writing, there's energy in it. There's consciousness in it. There's, there's, you can feel the frequency of where somebody's coming from, even in, you know, what's just seems like a, a white page with black words on it. And I could feel your conviction and your love and your care inside of the writing. And I just think it's so beautiful. And I'm grateful that we get to have this conversation. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And I remember a few years ago, I was working with a client and I asked him, who are the most inspiring people in the world that you, you know, would love to um, emulate? And uh, one of my clients had written down your name and I was mm. like, oh, that's so beautiful. Like, cause oh, I had already known you and your work and it really touched me because that was a totally different side. He's a very business, successful business person. And I hadn't expected him to put your name there. And mm -hmm. it just opened up this whole world of possibilities for, for me to understand him and mm -hmm. what brought joy into his life. And I know that you do that for so many people and Instagram and YouTube and all the magical things. And now your book and it's really cool. So I would love to dive in because you have this interest in abundance. We both have this interest in like, what is this life of prosperity of abundance? What is that mean to you and why does it matter so much like why would you go spend all this time writing a book about it what mm -hmm. why you know um so and and books are interesting and i know you know this um you can just go write a book but really you have to be called you have to be tapped on the shoulder because it's an entire journey and as you write the book it writes you and I didn't necessarily want to write this book. I had to. And I had to because um, of where I uniquely sit and where the, like where, where the energy and the consciousness of the world is right now. So, uh, you know, 11 years ago, I was living at my mom's house uh, as a surf instructor who was meditating and doing ayahuasca. And I was super spiritual dude and all of that stuff. And I had this moment where I recognized that I was avoiding, right? I, I was sitting in, the, in, the, in this like, 
oh, look how good I am, how, how um, spiritual I am. And I had this spiritual ego, but the truth was, was that I was avoiding uh, a very particular section of life. And that was working through the, 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 the broken parts of my identity that could receive and believe that success was possible for me. So um, a lot of people confuse money and wealth. And um, money, uh, or, or let's say wealth is like food, and money is like a spoon, right? The, 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 the spoon will bring the wealth to us, but it's, the spoon doesn't matter, really. It's just a vehicle. It's an in-between. It's a byproduct. We, we can use it or we can't. If you and I were, you know, lost in Antarctica, if we had boatloads of money, it would mean nothing because the real wealth would be in the warmth and the food and the shelter. And so what I began to realize, and, and I had to go through this journey, I had to go get it all um, and see and reconfigure who I was inside of it. And the big aha for me is I had a moment where I was on La Brea Boulevard in Los Angeles, uh, putting gas in my beat up Prius. And I knew, I knew that I had $8. I knew it. And uh, I said, okay, I'm gonna put $4 in. And as I'm putting $4 in my tank, I just had this moment where I'm like, you are too dope of a human. You are too, your, your heart is so, such gold to be in the position you're in. And because I'm in this position, I am a liability to my mom, to my sister, to my community. Because if I were to get hurt, if I were to drive that car off and get into an accident, my mom would sell everything she possibly has in order to make sure I was okay. And so I had this moment where I was like, nope, something's off. And it's important that I make myself a walking, talking, living demonstration of what is possible. And uh, money is something we do not get to escape. People come to me all the time and they'll say, oh, you do these podcasts, you coach all these people for all these years, what's the thing? And I say, that's easy. It's parents, sex, and money. You can run from your parents a little bit. You can hide sex behind the scenes, but money, we're having 20,000 interactions with it every day. And so if you have a, uh, let's call it unhealthy relationship with the tool, the spoon, called money, then that's, you're, you're getting shame hits and trauma every single day, 30, 40, 50 times a day. And so for me, I just wanted to clean that up for myself so that I could just keep giving my gifts. And then once I did, and, and I started to understand the laws of the universe and how to use them and break them and, and contort them. And I understood that there was no Santa Claus in the sky saying these people are better than these people, but that the one universal law, uh, that the quantum field was always saying yes. And I went, well, why not me? And, and, and the universe responded. And there's a lot more to that. And I know I said a lot, so I'm just gonna <laughs> pause. <laughs> Sitting where you sit today and thinking about that person that you were 11 years ago, like, what would you say were maybe the top two or three things that like had to shift for you along the way to, to bring you into this moment? Mm, um, I think that one of the first pieces is the decision that it's possible. Um, the law of mind uh, essentially states, and it's been said in the Bible, um, it is done unto you as you believe, right? So if I have a belief that it's not possible, then the law of mind and the law of yes will say, fantastic, I'll show you, right? Then the, then the, our biology steps in and the, the, uh, we filter things in and out based on that belief. So for me, one of the biggest pieces was when I had enough space, enough uh, light in the in the darkness, I said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna choose to believe that it's possible for me because ready is not a feeling, ready is a decision. So I'm just gonna decide right now. And that decision was really big. The next piece, which I think is really important for all people, and I still use this principle all the time, is, <clears throat> excuse me, is the understanding that elevation requires separation that we don't get to keep. 
uh, we don't get to hang on the side of the pool and swim. One, I have to either let go or I can just kick on the side of the pool and watch everybody else have fun. But if I want to actually elevate, I have to let go of something. And so I had to go have conversations with my dad, with some of my friends, with my family. And I said, hey, I'm going to be gone for a while because I need to go in. I need to go inward so I can go outward. There's some stuff I need to work on. And if I stay hanging with you guys, if I go to the club and I'm drinking and smoking and I'm doing all the Hollywood stuff with you guys, I'm, you get who you hang around with. And, and I'm not calling you right, uh, wrong or bad, but there's something that I cannot ignore anymore. And I got to go get it. And so I moved in with my mom and spent all the money I was spending on rent on workshops and books and people spaces. And I just kept gathering until I became my own ecosystem and, and the thing took off. Mm. The, this idea of letting go or separating, like you said, I can see it showing up in so many different places in my life. For example, I've written a new book and I was invited to write a book about abundance by my publisher. And when we got into it, there was what they wanted. And then what came through me, totally mm. different. Mm. And they were pissed. I will be mm. honest with you, pissed off, my agent especially. Like, why can't you just do what you're told? Ugh. let's go. Oh, and I'm, I'm not going to lie, like that was not a pleasant experience because mm -hmm. what came through me was so beautiful and so powerful. And it wasn't just me. I was testing it with hundreds of people around the world. And they were like, this is so powerful. This is unlike anything I've ever done before. Yes. And I'm still inside of it because I'm finishing up this book. But ultimately, I think the letting go in this situation is... I don't need a publisher mm -mm. to do this in today's <laughs> day and age. And no. even someone told me the other day that your book, it's funny, you mentioned Barnes and Noble. My book is sold really well at Barnes and Noble. And a friend of mine said, well, even if you self-publish, she's a publisher. She's like, you can go to Barnes and Noble and invite them. Like your book sold well. So here's another book. Will you carry it? Like the possibilities are endless beyond, mm. but I was trapped in this yes. idea that I need that publisher. And it's like, they really don't do all that much, especially that much. in this, in the space of creative genius, which is what I feel like came through me. And so I love this lesson because I'm living it right now. <laughs> yes, that is huge. Um, as somebody, I published with Simon & Schuster, the first two books, and this one, absolutely not. And I probably never would go with a publisher again. And it's for some of the reasons you just spoke to. And I also, um, I'm a, I am like to have the creative control even after, right? Like, um, but the big piece outside of all of that is congratulations to you for having the courage to go against the machine, right? And not that the machine is wrong or bad because they, they want it to do well. And from their consciousness and their understanding, they think it should be like this. Here's a crazy thing. I've never said this um, yet on a single podcast. Um, I work with this company called One Book Millionaire. And their whole thing is you write it, AI writes it, ghostwriter. So three writers, we go back and forth, we figure it out until we get a thing that feels good. So that happened. The whole entire book was finished. And then, and this was a week and a half ago, two weeks, two weeks ago, two weeks ago, whole book's finished. I go through it and I say, this is not it. And I throw it away. The whole book, <laughs> whole book. entire book, I threw it away and I rewrote it in five and a half days, the whole thing, mm -hmm. morning, noon, and night. And sometimes you have to go all the way into something, whether it's a relationship, whether it's a career, to know that isn't it. And then have the, the, the courage, right? And the discipline 
to, to make a new decision. And, and I've literally never said this on a, on a podcast yet, but that's true. And it's, it's, it's a part of my story, right? Like even this, I haven't got the book back yet. This is a dummy copy. This is somebody else's book that they just sent me the, see, that says something completely different. That's not my book, right? They just sent me this for, to see what the, the cover looks like, right? But my book will be something different. And it's so beautiful for me. To, to one, I'm so glad I didn't have a publisher because I would have been screwed. I would just had a book out there that didn't feel in alignment, right? Number two, um, I'm grateful for all the things I did seven years ago to put myself in a position where I could make that decision and still be good. And I think when it comes to finances and abundance, which are two different things but can overlap, uh, a lot of people play the short game. They, and, and, you know, I was coaching a group yesterday. I have a, a, a group called the Spiritual Millionaire Academy. And somebody was asking uh, a question about like, how do I get myself in position um, to, you know, live my dream life? And I said, today, you, the stuff you do today is going to affect 20 years from now. And if you, if you were willing to take the next two years to really, really go there, you could position yourself for 20. But a lot of people are, um, oh, that's what it was. They, the question came up around, if I get unexpected bills, what do I do, right? I want to build this thing out, but this thing happened with the house, this thing happened with my car. And I said, most people, when things like that happen, they contract. They go, oh, I'll cut expenses. I'll, I'll go down, 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 down. And that's, that's not wrong or bad. It just depends on where you're doing it from, the consciousness from which you're doing it from. All my rich friends, all my rich friends, when things like that happen, they expand. They look at the very thing and they go, okay, cool. I'm not in position right now, but what do I need to do to expand beyond the quote unquote problem? And that is something that is not often taught to the everyday person. And to me, that's what I did. It's what you're doing right now with your new book. What is it called, by the way? The Abundance Experiment. Let's go. And Let's it's go. a parable. It's a fictional parable. That's what's causing all the problems. Mm -hmm. Is I wasn't a fiction writer, yet this story came through me. And what's so cool about it is that I know you know this because you work with people like I do around money and challenges. Mm -hmm. They bring the ego with them when yes. they work around money. It's like so intertwined and it's quite difficult to get people to separate from their ego when they're learning about their relationship with money. And I think the reason it came through in a fictional parable is that when we're reading a story about someone else, mm -hmm. we put our ego aside and the book is a workbook. So every chapter you're invited to go into that mm -hmm there's two or three questions that you're journaling about. So you're having the experience yep. with someone going through it and it, it separates, well, people are having breakthroughs but while they go through it. And, and I love, I mean, I'm sure you're the same way. You get to a point when you're coaching, you're like, okay, I can only serve so many people mm -hmm. in you know the day to day, face to face, and then you do group programs. You're like, but I can still only solve you know so right. many challenges. And the book to me is like the most powerful way to touch, you know, right. potentially millions of people. And I wanted it so people could do the work inside of the experience mm. and they don't understand it because it's not been tested before. Correct. Correct. And, and the same was true for airplanes and the, <laughs> an engine inside of a car and uh, the iPod and things of that nature. And so those who were seen dancing were called crazy by those who couldn't hear the music. And you hear yeah. the music and they can't. And, and um, yeah, again, good on you. And I hope everybody listening or watching understands that we just give you two real life examples. This is not, you know, you know 12 years ago. This is... <laughs> This is present moment work and we're living inside of the same stuff that we teach. And there's, there's something beautiful about trusting and understanding that you can't miss and you can't fail. And to me, that's a part of, I, people are like, how, I've had a lot of trauma in my life. I've got just kicked in the face a lot. Um, and I've seen death 
bloody deaths. I've seen, it just been, I've been through a lot, and I've been able to develop this sort of like bulletproof mindset where it's not even a mindset anymore. It just lives in my body, and I have enough proof. And most people do too. They just don't know it. That no matter how bad it gets, no matter how dark the storm gets, it there it, it always passes usually followed by a rainbow, usually, usually followed by a lot of growth, right? And um, I think if people understood, like truly understood that what they seek is actually seeking them, that the thing that you want genuinely wants you, and that whether it's the shirt I have on or the black leather chair you're sitting in, it all wants to be used. It all wants to be imbued all materials, all air, everything, the cells in our body, it's all circulating. And so the, the game is just to be receptive, right? My mentor, Michael Beckwith says that the best ability is availability. And I think a lot of people just aren't available to see that the abundance they're seeking is right here, right now. And, and when they do, they instantly move into having consciousness. Right? There's a, in my book, I have this whole thing about the haves and the have-nots. And it's our job to be in the haves. Right? What am I having right now? Because you can't have what you want, but you may experience what you currently have. And so if I'm having abundance, if I'm having under, an understanding that, that, that life is occurring, I'm, I'm in a room using a computer with air conditioning flowing. I can go get some water, some food. I can go watch Netflix. I am living the dream. I have more technology here than the kings and queens of, of Egypt and different lands. Like we are winning so hard right now. And yet so many of us get caught in the, the, the weapon of mass distraction and the illusion of the mind, the cancer of the mind, that there is actually such thing as scarcity. Rich people don't even see it that way. They're like, oh yeah, no, no, no. We could just print more money. Just call it in. Hmm. So, in <laughs> so interesting. I get I get uh, robbed up, revved up sometimes. I, I love this subject. <laughs> I love it. When people are coming to you, what would you say is the top challenge that people get stuck with and can't get out of all by themselves? Hmm. I think people initially come to me because they, um, even the title, spiritual millionaire, right? It, it feels like they don't go together for most people. And I, I actually think it does. And um, I think they come to me because they, they want to feel and experience life like they perceive I am, one. Two, they are tired of... Um, sort of chasing their tail and they want to know what I know so that they can, you know, feel alive, right? This is what it all comes down to. What are you trying to really get to? Ah, personal freedom, aliveness. Okay, awesome. Um, and ultimately, they want permission, permission to go live and find out. And so, you know, I was coaching a woman who lives in Sedona, actually, uh, a few months back. And she was like, why am I so stuck? I have been just like stuck around money. I was like, well, let's find out. I said, okay, how old, how young are you? And she was like, oh, I'm 57. Okay, I said, okay. In your 57 years, about how much money do you believe, you can give me a ballpark, has flowed through your bank account or someone else's to pay for your mortgage or rent? And you could see the light bulb starting to click. And she's like, maybe half a million, a million. Exactly. Okay. So we're already talking about a divine manifestation, half a million dollars on rent, mortgage. You have always made it. You have never been stuck when it comes to a house, correct? And it ding, 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 you see the light bulbs. And now all the other people on the Zoom are like, they're having their same moment, right? Now, okay, so let's, let's just leave that one there. About how much money do you think has come through your bank account for clothing and entertainment, right? Now it's like, ding, 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 she's adding this up. And I'm like, so, so where most people get stuck is they don't understand 
how money works and how much of it is in their space currently, right? They will literally say to me, I'm stuck with money while having that conversation from a thousand dollar iPhone. And I'm like, okay, so tell me how many nights you've slept on the street. Well, none. Okay. I, just so I'm clear, how many nights have you starved? Well, none. Okay. Of the years that you've been on this planet, how many of those have you not been able to, let's say, go to the movies or do something fun with your friends? Well, none. Okay, so we're we're talking about zero to, right? Here's all your scarcity thoughts. And and the big the, the big thing, and I'll land this here. The big thing is um, uh, William James, philosopher, talks about the distinction between the firstborn and the secondborn, right? And uh, a lot of spiritual people are moving from firstborn, which is scarcity and external approval and all of that stuff, uh, victim consciousness, to secondborn. Right? They meditate, they they do yoga, they go to Joe Dispenza, they do a workshop, they they start to like wake up. They they know something's there, and so they're in the transition from firstborn to secondborn. Secondborn is when we 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 understand that we can't miss, that we can't fail, that God and love is all there is, was, never will be. Our second born consciousness is when we move into the state of uh, use me, right? Use me, spirit. I am a vessel for your light, your love. What do you need me to write? Okay, a, a fictional story on abundance. Let's go, right? What do you need me to do? Where you want me to live? Who do you want me to bless? Who do you want me to hug? Who do you want me to compliment, right? We, we move out of our way and we're in our creative prefrontal cortex. And people come to me usually when they're in between those. where they're like, uh... How do I how do I do this? And they have like profound openings when it comes to certain things in their lives. And this is my big teaching with them. Because they'll say, Oh, I'm I'm bad here. And I'll say, Okay, well, where are you good? And I go, Oh, well, health and eating and um the gym. And I say, Okay, so the same principles. Tell me every principle you have done to get your body to look like that. And what did you have to believe to get your body to look like that? What do you have to, what are the practices and the habits? And every single one of those applies for the thing they think they're stuck in. And so I'm just, I'm usually just ushering and giving people permission and cracking their paradigms so that they can discover what's really there, which is, you know, this thing could be gone in a day. Right? You may not be here four years from now. And so are you going to live life on a layaway plan? Or are you going to get that those butterflies outside your door are miracles? Are you going to wait until you meet the guy to fall in love with yourself? Or are you going to reclaim your divine feminine and express your gift in ways you never knew how? And just to gift yourself, let alone humanity, right? I, this is so, it's so deep. People come to me for abundance financial stuff. And it's always, we always go back to like mother, father, Masculine, feminine polarity, like opening. <laughs> it's crazy. It's crazy. I love you know. it. You know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the something that um, is just coming up in the moment, I know because I heard you speak about your relationship with your mother. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it's been a very big catalyst for you on your journey. And what, what I will say I heard or felt, and you can let me know if I'm on the right track, is absolute acceptance of who you are and the divine nature of who you are. It, it, that, that comes through your mm -hmm. mom and her love for you. Am mm -hmm. I on the right track with that? Yes. Yes, it's there's so many layers to our relationship and healing the mother wound for myself. It's it's interesting. My dad has an Audi. And in my workshops with Alexi, we we talk about that in the very beginning. Some of you have Audis, some of you have innies. Right? Speaking to belly buttons, but an Audi is a person who's who's outward, it's easy to see how crazy they are. It's easy to see their faults, it's easy to see their wounds, right? You're like, oh yeah, that person's crazy as hell, right? I have an Audi. My wife has an any, right? So, so that's the person where it's a little more subtle. They look like a regular person, but they're crazy as hell and they have just the same wounds and all that <laughs> stuff, right? And so, so my mom surface level 
is in any person. Anybody who ever meets her, they're like, your mom is the greatest human ever. And I'm like, you are correct. She is dope as hell. And um, my mom witnessed her brother get his head blown off with a shotgun when she was 14. She, you know, skipped meals as a child. Um, she is the only of six brothers and sisters. She's the only one that is half white because my grandmother cheated on her husband. And this other guy cheated on his wife and they had my mom. And she was a secret most of her life. Um, and so she just looked different than her brothers and sisters, but nobody ever questioned it, but there was something there. And long story short, my mom, um, when she was 14, made a decision that she, if she ever had kids, they weren't going to live how she was. And so she moved herself and us when we were finally, I was born in Compton, uh, which is not necessarily the greatest place. It is now. Um, but back then it was not. And she instantly took my sister and I and my dad, and we all moved to Harbor City, which was a more like middle class, Dennis the Menace kind of deal. And we moved out of the quote unquote ghetto. But what didn't change was her consciousness around money. Now, my mom is an accountant. Um, and my sister's a CPA accountant. So it runs in the family, right? They are on it. My mom's also a Virgo, which is one of the, <laughs> one of the signs where you're like, this person is on it, right? super loving, beautiful soul. And she, from a, from a scarcity perspective, always made us believe that we were one paycheck away from sleeping on the streets. And I couldn't decipher that as a seven-year-old. I didn't understand what the game she was playing as a 12-year-old. And so I was that kid that if somebody said, if my mom said, hey, you want $5 for lunch? I'd say, no, just give me two. Or I'll eat what I had yesterday. It's all good. And I became an out of the way kid based on her stress levels and my dad being an Audi person who's cheating and doing drugs and their divorce and the whole thing. Long story short, my mom throughout all of that has had my back through and through. She has loved me. She has believed in me. Um, both my mom and dad are very physically affectionate and kissy and I'm so proud of you and all that stuff. And the big piece that, even as a 44 year old man now, um, my mom watched a show. I was on Tom Bilyeu's Impact Theory a few years, like six years back, maybe seven. She watched it and she called me and she said, I am so sorry. And I don't know how many of you have ever had your mom or dad say, I'm sorry for something, but it cracked me. Mm. She apologized for putting me in special needs and special education as a child and not fighting for my genius um, because I was in class with schizophrenic children and Down syndrome and Asperger kids. And I made up an entire world about who I was based on what I was seeing in that class. And it had a profound effect, effect on me. It's still something I have to work through. And it, um, the imposter syndrome of like, those are regular people and you're one of the dummies. And she apologized. Mm -hmm. And it, it speaks to her heart and her willingness to continue to love me, even though I'm a grown ass man. She, mm -hmm. we just text two hours ago. She's, she takes care of my children. Um, she takes care of the houses that we have all over Austin. My mom is a superhero. And without her, I would, I promise you, I would not be the man I am today. Mm -hmm. But I'm hearing inside of that, Perhaps the way that you communicate about the relationship that you have with her now is an evolution mm -hmm. of understanding, self-understanding. And then, I mean, that process, I think we all need to go through if we haven't forgiving our parents for the things that they probably didn't understand were affecting us in a certain way. But mm -hmm. it's a culmination of that. But what it was also kind of, leading me up to was how important is self-compassion for mm. someone on the journey. Some of us, I would say it's remarkable how similar our stories are. I was born in Oakland. My parents did move to a more suburban place, but we were like the low income kids in the suburbs <laughs> to get out of sort of mm -hmm. the inner city, but so many similarities. But if 
I, and, and even the touchy feely, I love you. I'm proud of you. Like so much support I got. So I feel like we're exceptional because I don't know about you, but a lot of people that I have worked with have not had those sorts of relationships with their parents. So the question and the lead up to that is how important is self-compassion, whether or not you had that sort of support mm -hmm. growing up? Yeah, it's, I mean, it, we're all on a journey home to the self right to to know thyself is the and is one of the most important journeys we'll ever take and i think the closer we get to understanding how nervous systems work and how our psyches are formed uh the more important it is to give what we believe is missing to ourselves first so i'm i've been married my wife and i've been together for 11 years and uh, about seven and a half, eight years ago, we almost had a divorce. And a big part of it was we both had so much resentment for the other one not filling our cups. And I, I had all this stuff like, you should be this. You're a woman. I, I need your nurture. I need your X. I need your Y. And really what, that, what was speaking was the little boy, the wounded little boy who was trying to replace what he didn't get from his mom in certain ways in his wife. And that's not sexy. It doesn't feel good for her. And it, it, we kept clashing. And she had her own version of that. And the big realization that I had and, and I'm still swimming in and living in is the only thing ever missing from any situation is what I'm not willing to give or be in consciousness. And so self-compassion and self-love is literally at the top because it sets the tone for everything else. And... My belief is that the God I serve and the God that created us, the, the quantum field, Jesus, Krishna, Buddha, Allah, whatever you want to call that thing, I believe that it has never made a mistake and that there isn't a single leaf on that money tree back there, nor a blade of grass, nor a human that isn't beautiful and imbued with consciousness and power. And so it's our job to shine as bright as we possibly can. And how do I shine bright? Well, I, I, I love on the areas where I've been programmed to hate. I used to hate my quote unquote nappy black African hair, this Nigerian thick hair. I used to hate my skin color. I asked my mom when I was nine, could I get blue contacts in my eyes? Because that's how much I hated myself. I wanted to look like the cool white kids and like the fake Jesus and Santa Claus and everything else and all that hatred internalized, I then had to reclaim. And a lot of people come into my space. That's exactly what we're working on is can you love those parts? When you look in that mirror and you see those thighs or you see one nipple is bigger than the other or smaller than the other or, or there's hair growing in places you don't think it should be, right? Can you look at that and go, no, no, no mistakes in God perfection, right? Can you see a rainbow or a puppy or a giggling baby and go, oh my God, how cute, how beautiful, how sweet. And then look at yourself and have the same experience. Because that to me, if you, and I do, not now I do. I didn't used to. Now, I, I'm, I, my number one job is to see the face of God in everything, including myself. And, and that to me makes me rich rich in spirit, rich in consciousness. And um, it just feels good to be free in that way. And mm -hmm. it's some of the most important work we can do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could talk to you forever. This mm -hmm. is so beautiful. What is the next step for folks who wanna mm -hmm. dive into your world? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I would highly suggest anybody who's even slightly interested in some of the stuff we talked about, you grab Spiritual Millionaire, um, Unlock the Seven Inner Laws of Abundance and Money. Uh, this is at PrestonSmiles.com uh, forward slash book. Um, if you're on YouTube or podcast or Instagram, it's just at Preston Smiles. You can find me. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty out there and crazy and wild and all the things. Um, and if I never see you or talk to you or hear from you ever again, thank you. Thank you for your time, for your love, for your attention. I believe that birds of a feather do flock together. And uh, Lisa, I, I think that we are kindred spirits 
And I think that anybody who finds you is also like you. And, and, and that's like me. So I just love, I love everybody. I trust that things are supposed to be where they're supposed to be. Mm -hmm.